So thanks everyone for coming. Obviously, thanks for the opportunity to speak and share. Um, today, we are primarily going to be talking about um, specific aspects of our music and how they've developed over the nine years that we've been working together um, and ways in which that is indicative of and relates to all other aspects of uh, our work together, which um, I think in many respects is relatively unique. Um, just as a little bit of an overview, um, apologies, I'm reading notes on the second screen, uh, so I'm not ignoring anyone. Um, Liam and I, yes, met um, about nine years ago at the Salt Festival in Victoria. Um, and just a couple months after that, I wrote my first piece for him, and I've been writing for him ever since. Um, at this point, it's kind of hard to count, which we'll get into a little bit, but I would say somewhere in the realm of I don't know, seven to 10 pieces that I've written for him, um, maybe an hour's worth of music or so, which for me is quite a bit of music. Um, uh, and maybe a little bit more uh, indicative. Um, I like to keep track when we talk about our work, we have the opportunity to present our work, uh, how many emails we've exchanged in that time. So uh, to date, uh, as of an hour ago, we have exchanged approximately 1,250 emails, which works out to about one every 2.6 days over the course of nine years, which is a uh, rate that uh, we've been holding steady at for the last uh, couple of years. So just to say we have a very long-term, extensive and proactive dialogue together um, that the music reflects uh, in and of itself. So um, a little more specifically, and I'll pass it over to Liam. Um, today, we're basically going to be talking about um, development of certain embouchure specific techniques in our music. Um, and you'll note, like just as a, a default, I use uh, the first person plural, our music, um, because we've really developed these in tandem um, back and forth and sort of riffed off each other. Um, and at this point, it's very hard to draw the line as to what either of us are responsible for, except for the fact that I know he can play the clarinet and I cannot. Um, so Liam is going to start introducing the first project we worked on and some of the directions that it sparked, and we'll take it from there. Yeah, so um, sort of just following up on what Ray said, um, our first project was actually like a, a commission. I commissioned a pair of pieces from Ray. The first was a, a small uh, duo for piccolo and E flat clarinet. That's about four and a half, five minutes long. And then the second one was a more substantial solo uh, piece for E flat. And I, I, I don't quite remember, but I think the idea was uh, that they would sort of feed off each other in some way and you know that we would get a dialogue going and uh, as we mentioned we sort of worked together at this festival and uh, had a great dialogue there so that that relationship uh, that aspect of the relationship was sort of well established from the from the get-go um, I'm just going to screen share the score um, here we go. So there, there, there's a couple elements this is just an excerpt of the uh, E flat clarinet part um, from about a third of the way into the piece. Uh, so the, the, the piece, as Ray mentioned, was premiered, um, I guess, in 2013. And there were kind of a few elements coming out of the piece that were uh, really of interest to us in terms of um, finding ways to like nuance them and develop them in, in a really specific and interesting way. Uh, and the, the sort of the best example of this and one that ties into the embouchure work that you'll see in the remainder of the pieces is this idea of the, the bite. Um, which which uh, you can see a couple examples of it in here. I've highlighted them in red. This is my annotated score. Um, the bite was was something that we hadn't really discussed during I think Ray's composition process. So it sort of arrived to me, um, and from that point, like there there were some not not problems, but like issues in terms of the, the ways that that it was used and certain. Uh, I guess connotations that the notation has that were really of interest. And so um, I think the first of these is that we found that it was like very highly contingent on what was around it in terms of the material. So you can see uh, just even within the first two bars of this example, two different uses of the bite. There's this kind of bite that's on its own with rests uh, on either side. And then there's a bite that follows uh, this kind of low E uh, glissando air sound type 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 uh, material. Um, and what, what I found in, in performance was that like this yielded two completely different results um, because in the, in the latter case, when it was sort of abutted against materials, uh, it, 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 it took on the sort of transformative quality of, uh, it, it wasn't really clear where the bite sort of began and ended. It, it just kind of, it, it became this kind of transformation out of the material into a different 
into a different type of thing, um, which is which is some, somewhat at odds with the notation, which sort of implies that it's a, a very specific sound. Um, and so there was this kind of tension in the work in, in, in these moments trying to find like the balance between the physical action and the, uh, the sort of like notated sound. Um, I'll, I'll play just the next, oh, sorry, right. Yeah, so, sorry, I don't mean to jump in out of turn, but um, just to add a little bit, um, because I think it's worthwhile to emphasize um, my intention from the get-go kind of naively in my composer utopian fashion um, was that the bike would be a relatively singular, isolated and consistent sound. Um, and as Liam alluded to, depending on the context, um, depending on the speed, which is often very rap rapid and idealistic, um, that often was not the case. So the reason I just kind of wanted to go out of our way to underscore that is because um, I think what follows next, as we'll see in a bit, is where it really becomes interesting and a sort of uh, emblematic of how Liam and I approach things where one or the other will try a thing or envision a thing that won't work the way we expect it, uh, often but not always coming from the composer's side. Um, and then the other will sort of share their findings and then we'll, rather than try to get rid of those, we'll sort of turn it into, it's not a bug, it's a feature kind of approach where we seek to exploit uh, whatever possibilities are inherent in that. So anyway, I just wanted to put that, that for a bit, but please, Liam, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm just gonna play like a short excerpt, basically the, the score that I was, I was showing earlier. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so very short excerpt. Um, basically, the only other sort of point coming out of this as, as we're getting into the, the next pieces is that um, there's, there was already a certain amount of like density and complexity to the material in, in this piece. Um, and that's something that I was sort of interested in exploring and I'll pass it back to Ray for our next, our next piece uh, with that in mind. Yeah, and so to bridge off of that a bit, um, you know, as someone who writes, generally speaking, relatively technically difficult and ambitious music and is interested in that side of things, um, it was really um, striking to me that coming out of this first experience, uh, me asking Liam, hey, what about the piece interest you, right? Is there anything technically, aesthetically, et cetera, um, sort of jumped out of you that would be an intriguing starting point for your desire to explore the instrument, um, especially the E flat, which is a less commonly used uh, clarinet. Um, and the first thing he did was point to the hardest passages of music and speak to specifically being interested in, in the technical challenges and sort of liminality um, of those. And so that just communicated something to me about his attitude, uh, willingness and interest and how it overlapped with my own. That sort of served as a jumping off point and here we are nine years later. Um, yeah, so again, we had this issue of the bite and the bite as um, oftentimes not being a sort of discrete and self-consistent sound, but rather something um, that could be operable over the conventional sound of the clarinet. So in the Glissandi example that Liam showed, oftentimes that bite became um, more about uh, an overlaid sound at the end of that low E, right? That shifted it registrally and timbrally um, and all this kind of stuff. And so we began discussing and exploring different ways that we could uh, adjust the embouchure um, over conventional pitch rhythm material. Um, and that led to, again, a bunch of exploration, a bunch of exchange back and forth recordings where he would send me something. So for example, he would send me, hey, here's what the bite sounds like over the octatonic scale going up two octaves. Um, and my response would be, okay, can what about is there like levels of degree? Do we have a mild bite, right? Uh, versus a more strongly present bite? What's the opposite of the bite, which became a sort of slackening, uh, what we call open embouchure, a slackening uh, of the side of the embouchure, um, which sort of drops, so to speak. Liam can speak a little bit more accurately about the specific technical and sonic things that are at play there. Um, but anyway, it became this conversation of exploring various possibilities. Um, that really played a role um, in the E flat climate solo that we're going to show you a bit surely the long tail end uh, my conversation. I don't know if you mind pulling that up. Um, the last point that I would make is, you know, um, 
these sort of technically and sonically disruptive uh, elements that we could that uh, can be layered on top of each other in a single instrument context was something that I had very mild precursors for, and this was sort of the right moment and the right prompt to sort of push me into um, exploring uh, this in much greater and more thorough detail than I had previously. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to play a clip from this solo E flat clarinet piece. Uh, of mine narratives um and then we'll take it from there yeah and and just uh say like the score will be up again with the video and you'll see uh typically it's like below the 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 uh, staff there's uh lines indicating like open bite and this this kind of thing so just kind of watch out for that Liam, is yours playing? I'm not hearing it. Oh. So you're not you're not hearing it? Yeah, let me let me try. Correct. It again. Yeah, yeah. I don't okay. think we got the, uh, okay. the score video. All right, hang on. It wouldn't be a Zoom conference without some. Technology. Yeah, without without some some glitch. Yeah. Okay. Here, let's try try this. <laughs> Yeah. So um, basically, I think you know there's there's a lot sort of at play there. Obviously, um, really, uh, I think striking moments for us were like the uh, overlaid um, bites and like transitional bites and oscillating bites, especially um, over like slower material. Um, that's sort of a theme that we kind of picked up on in this piece, and you'll hear more of that going forward. Um, basically just in terms of the performance like really briefly uh for full bite i'm just like really kind of clamping down a lot of jaw pressure i like to think about it vertically in terms of ter in terms of just like a lot of uh, vertical pressure on the embouchure just like almost closing off the reed altogether uh there's a kind of step below that which is uh just kind of coloring the sound a little bit with that with that bite but not not quite closing it off um and then there's open which is just kind of lowering the jaw to the point that the sound gets really airy and, and distorted um pitches drop out, stuff like that, especially if, if we're working with the higher register. Uh, that's, that's sort of all that I wanted to say. Oh, and then, yeah, transitions between those states. And then there's a couple different oscillating bites. There's a kind of slower one, uh, which transitions between like the full open and the full bite, and then a really just like fast and kind of extreme one. And, yeah, I think, uh, I think we'll move on to the next piece. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, so basically after these two E-flat pieces, um, I was I was kind of tired. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we took a break. <laughs> yeah, we, we we took a little break, um, uh, and and so we sort of like yeah let let it just kind of sit for a bit, and we came back and we had an interest in exploring like a different instrument. Um, the the pieces of rays that I had read even before our commissions were also for the E flat clarinet, so uh, I think we had both had a feeling of just kind of like okay we've kind of uh, worked with this instrument like pretty substantially. Let's let's see how this um, how this kind of 
these ideas translate across the clarinet family. So we picked the bass clarinet as the next, the next one. Um, and then sort of developing these embouchure techniques even further, uh, we had the idea of um, uh, expanding, like, so we had this kind of like vertical idea of different uh, levels of pressure on the aperture of the mouthpiece and reed. And so I also thought about like, what if we kind of move the horizontal plane to a certain extent and had, you know, a different um, relationship between the embouchure and the mouthpiece. And this was especially like works really well on bass clarinet because obviously there's a lot of room to work with, uh, whereas the E flat there's it's really we're talking like tiny degrees. Um, and so we came up with this 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 idea basically um, of of uh, different embouchure uh, positions relative to the mouthpiece. So we have uh, four in total. We have um, num and they're, they're numbered. You'll see in in the score example coming up. Uh, we have starting with number one, which is like almost no. Uh, mouthpiece and reed in the embouchure and, and even just sort of like extending kind of like the embouchure outwards as you draw the instrument away. So like very diffuse sound, uh, you know, in some cases there's, there's just like nothing happening aside from air um, and then kind of like uh, a middle degree between that and a normal embouchure, which is two and three respectively. And then we have four, which is like taking not like a whole bunch of mouthpiece in, but I, I think of it as just kind of like pressing a little bit more against the mouthpiece. Uh, it really activates a lot of high harmonics. Um, as probably a lot of you can just kind of get from, from the description. Um, and, and so like, like playing with these in the same way that we were playing with the kind of vertical, um, the vertical elements of, of changing the embouchure and seeing in ways that they, that they would interact basically. So that, that was sort of the parameters that we were working with um, for, this, for this next piece. Uh, Ray wrote, I guess, some very short, some very short little pieces. We had two uh, for bass clarinet, one that's about like three seconds long and the other is about a minute long. Um, I think that's sort of all that I want to say about that for the time being, unless you want to add anything. No, if you want to play it, then I'll do my little spiel. Okay. Okay, I will try to get the sound this time. Oops, sorry. So this is the longer of the bass clarinet pieces, about one minute long. I'll throw it over to Ray. Yeah, so um, just a couple of things that I thought is worth noting there. So first and foremost, one of the things that um, is generally interesting to me about any technique that I'm approaching for any instrument is um, not, basically the more fluidly um, I can use it, the more interesting it is to me, right? It's, if it's something I can compose with, because otherwise I don't know what I as a composer am offering to the uh, situation. I mean, there are a lot of instrumentalists who can make a lot of cool sounds and they don't need me to do it. So um, if I'm trying to find uh, what is my role in this relationship, what's my contribution here, it really starts with um, playing with things. And so with that in mind, um, one of the things that, really emerged very quickly for me with these embouchure materials in general, and specifically with this new development that we introduced um, in the bass clarinet pieces of the horizontal mouthpiece position movement, um, was the ability to layer both of these things, right? Um, and that creates, let's say, uh, non-linear uh, states, right? Where we can say, for example, if you are smoothly transitioning from maximally uh, input mouthpiece to minimally input mouthpiece, that's a, uh, a relatively linear physical transition, but the soundscape that's happening, the effects uh, that that has over what it is, uh, over what it's happening um, upon, um, is not linear. It's not predictable. Um, so to the ear, especially to a non-clarinetist, um, you can't necessarily tell that this is a simple movement. Um, so it creates a lot of accessibility to radically different 
um, Tamble states in very quick succession. And then if we layer that upon these, uh, as Liam termed or referred to as vertical um, embouchure adjustments of bite, uh, of open, um, you can get some very interesting combinations, sometimes that um, uh, supplement each other that work well together. So for example, a one position uh, mouthpiece or a two position mouthpiece, right, is going to have a just very generically a, a more muffled uh, tone, sort of the soltasto of the clarinet in a certain kind of funny way, as my composer brain puts it. Um, but, and if I combine that with uh, the open embouchure, the vertical adjustment of open embouchure, those things relatively work together. And it's not perfect, but they're complementary in some ways. But if I um, add bite, then I'm getting something that's trying to push uh, the instrumental sound to the high register in combination with something that's sort of dropping the floor out a little bit. And that's also a very complicated um, airflow situation that itself creates um, interesting physical circumstances that can lead to all kinds of good stuff, all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, so that's why this became a very interesting tool for me that, again, wasn't just giving me more options. It wasn't a... Um, um, it wasn't increasing my vocabulary so much it was increasing my syntax. It gave me a lot more um, tools that had ramifications that weren't immediately evident as opposed to just learning different words, different specific uh, isolated sounds, right? So it really is an internalization of this observation we started with um, in Notables, the piccolo and the flat clarinet piece that, hey, these aren't discrete sounds. Right? These are sounds that happen on top of and adjust other sounds. The other point that I would really make here is, you know, as I've evolved with this material generally, I've tried to use it in a more concerted, uh, judicious is a strong word because I'm not a very judicious person, uh, I like a lot, um, but um, in a more thoughtful manner. Um, and so one of the uh, ways in which I found to do that is to basically slow down the rate of change in the on the staff conventional pitch rhythm material. So we can have these long tones, these long phrases, um, and over them have a relatively rapid pace of timbre change. Um, a different manifestation of the same desire is an increasing use of repetition of mostly pitch uh, and registral elements, sometimes rhythmic elements as well. Um, you can repeat a pattern that happens uh, towards the end of the bass clarinet piece we just listened to um, with relatively distinct um, treatments in terms of embouchure technique. And so it creates this sense of fracturing of sort of quasi memory. Oh, I think I've heard that before, but it's not a perfect repetition and not just perfect for the listener, but even uh, for Liam as a uh, uh, incredible uh, musician as Liam is, um, there is some element of uniqueness in each passage. And actually we're gonna lean into that in one of the following examples. Um, so anyway, lots of interesting sonic uh, and aesthetic possibilities. All right, yeah, so um, it gets in, it, we've done this presentation a few times and it gets harder and harder to pack everything in each time, um, but <clears throat> Sorry, we're up to sort of the most recent piece, um, which is a piece for solo basset horn. Um, and I love the basset horn and I've been pressuring Ray for ages to write for the basset horn. And we finally we finally got down to it uh, over the pandemic, I guess, because um, uh, I was able to like really sit down and um, catalog uh, like basset horn multiphonics, which is something that hadn't, hadn't really been done, uh, which you'll actually be able to read about in an upcoming issue of uh, the clarinet. Um, and so we, we we really kind of like delved into uh, the instrument itself, and in, in terms of like developing fingerings and timbral uh, fingerings and and uh, and multiphonics, and finding ways to just kind of like interrelate these in in uh, in in a, in a new way. I think we both sort of felt that like the embouchure, like there was still a little bit of work to be done, but we were really interested in like tackling the instrument itself in a more concrete way. Um, Anything to add to this, Ray, or should I just play the piece? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, and so like just it being the most recent piece, I'll just point out that like you know we, we talked primarily primarily about embouchure, but this sort of work really applied to like a lot of different facets of the music. Uh, this kind of detailed, nuanced look, and you know in terms of like finding different slap tongues, finding different timbres and stuff like that. So like there's a lot of detail that we're just kind of like leaving at the leaving by the way. Yeah, and when, and when he says a lot, I mean we're speaking to about 0.05 percent, right? Um, yeah. And and I do agree that um, our work is getting longer, but the presentation like this thing the same so it's a little <laughs> bit more difficult um, all right so yeah go for it please Here, here's the basset horn piece Thank <laughs> you. 
It's a dog outside my window. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that just bears brief mention is when you have this sort of prolonged an engagement with someone, um, it allows for a lot of unique uh, possibilities. Um, towards the end there, there is a triple parenthetical staccato tenuto over a sustained line. That's basically an inside joke that's developed um, as far back as narrative six years ago or seven years ago, however long it's been. Um, and there's a lot of that in there, uh, a lot of like, oh, you did this thing and you did it better than I thought you could do. So I'm gonna push you a little bit and see, can you do this or whatever. Um, the last thing I wanted to just mention briefly, um, and again, uh, we could do this for two hours and not hit all the notes, um, is the way in which working with someone in this kind of long-term back and forth way um, that is not focused on particular pieces or particular projects, but again, is really relationship driven. Um, it allows, it just allows for things that otherwise couldn't exist, couldn't happen. Um, and as a result of that, that includes us both entering territory that individually we're hesitant in. So one of the things that I try to do as someone who writes very difficult music is still make sure that I'm not overstepping the bounds where something is blatantly impossible. Um, and Liam uh, sort of has a corollary sense of hesitancy to that, just overstepping um, on a personal level in terms of what we are individually interested in. Um, but for all kinds of reasons that we can't really get into with the time constraint, um, we've done that. So this little example is from uh, a, a recent uh, B flat clarinet project, which is by the lengthiest, certainly in terms of time project we've ever undertaken. Um, and this is just a little excerpt, but this is one of the most, if not the most technically ambitious things I've written for him. Um, and it just is sort of a, let's say, look to the future uh, of where our work might go. And I will just add that um, when Liam and I do recording sessions, we have extensive notes where we, you know, have 27 takes of everything and we compare. Uh, and we've never been able to pick a preferred <laughs> take out of those two. So when we share them, we just share both of them. <laughs> um, so anyway, I know we're up against it, um, but if we have time for a question or a comment, um, I would certainly love to entertain it insofar as we're capable of doing so. Um, but otherwise, thank you uh, for yeah. listening to our stuff. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's kind of remarkable taking a look at the score and I've seen so many different um, types of notation um, this weekend that I've never been exposed to and I'm sure many other people are, are just looking at that thinking how did you, how did you think to alter the embouchure even further than when many other composers have done um, with regards to just biting and loosening what was, how did you come to that um, conclusion as to how you wanted to portray the music that you were composing? Well, I think the best way that I would put it is that we just condensed nine years of time and conversation in the span of 25, 28 minutes. You know what I mean? So, so by which I, I actually mean to communicate, I came to it slowly. It's something I've always been interested in, but I also am reticent to just adopt other people's tools because those tools are foreign to me. Um, and I feel that I can't sort of speak to them in any way that I find personally relevant and feels inauthentic to me just personally. Uh, as someone who's kind of uh, generally inclined to uh, existential woe, that's not uh, a, a step in the right direction. But having someone like Liam that I can have this back and forth dialogue with, who I know is engaged with um, this material with maximum fidelity and intensity. I mean, the the We've, we've had thousands of words of emails exchanged over the difference between a double parenthetical staccato tenuto and a mono parenthetical staccato tenuto. And how does that relate to the intrinsic articulative mechanics when you slur something? Like that's just stuff we like to talk about, you know? <laughs> when I catch up with Liam, I don't know what's going on with his life. He doesn't know what's going on with my life, but we'll talk for that stuff for two hours. Um, so so the how I arrived at that is, is really through this partnership. And honestly, if I hadn't begun this work with Liam, I don't know how much longer I would have sat at the threshold of that without really crossing into it. So this was um, the relationship, the music has really been a catalyst to do that 100%. Oh, that's great.
Uh, well, if no one else has any questions, um, or if you think of something during the next session, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, I've really enjoyed the session. We're going to um, turn it over to our next presenter, which is both a performance and um, a discussion lecture. So um, I hope you will enjoy that as well. Thank you guys both. Thank you so much. Thank you.